Ladies and gentlemen of the Shred Gaming Citicom video, if you're waiting to purchase Intel's Skylake CPU, then I may have some bad news for you. There were some rumours swirling around the internet that unfortunately the Skylake processors are actually going to be delayed until the third quarter. But this is not an official announcement from Intel. Instead, Intel are continuing to say to anyone who will listen that indeed they're right on track for the second quarter of this year. So what's this miscommunication or what's this confusion? Well, as I said, about a week ago, Intel said they would not be postponing the introduction of its codename Skylake CPUs, right? So us as customers, theoretically, will be able to purchase them at some point in an undisclosed uh, point of uh, the second quarter. But there's some sources that have stepped forward that have, and I quote, knowledge of Intel's plans. And they've just since revealed that this is actually not the case. And it's going to be delaying the commercial launch of the CPUs by about a quarter. Now, we don't know what that means in terms of, you know, the actual exact month. But it looks like it's going to be roughly a three-month delay. <clears throat> now, the real sucky part of this actually comes into the fact that not just are we going to see that delay, but supposedly high-performance PC parts, so in other words, the parts that you and I most likely care about if we're either gamers or video editors or I don't know, free, 3D rendering or so on and so on, those parts that we care about may not even become commercial at the moment, uh, even up until Computex, which is happening, of course, in early June. We might not actually see any, even of the mainboard CPUs or anything in that nature, which is a little bit odd because typically the second quarter of the year is when Intel releases its CPUs, which is why a lot of families actually are really upset after Christmas because just a couple of months later, particularly back in like the Pentium 2 era and Pentium 1 era, when new versions of the CPU like the Pentium MX and the Pentium Pro, then the Pentium 2 and so on and so forth, there were so many bloody versions of them, people came quite upset because just after Christmas, you know, six months later, there would be a new version of a CPU, not just a clock speed boost oftentimes. But what we're seeing here is, of course, this happened to Westmere, Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge, Haswell, uh, and so on. You know, the second quarter of the year, we've had a new chip, but this isn't looking to be on track at the moment. There's some rumours as to the reasons, and quite honestly, they are just rumours. One of the leading theories is because of a 14nm shrink, but that also may not really make much sense, because some... Um, developers, in fact, the chief executive officer at, over at Intel said, and I quote, Broadwell and, Broadwell and Skylake are on the same technology, the same piece of silicon, and the same factory. All we need to do is change the piece of glass in the scanner to get a different product. There is not a change or revamp in our factories that needs to occur for this. But, there may be a bit of an explanation that's not to do with problems from Intel, but rather the fact that Intel wishes to not compete against itself. Now you might recall that in my previous video regarding um, Skylake and Broadwell, that effectively the new Broadwell CPUs, the die shrinks, are going to be happening at roughly the time, same time, well this is pre these rumours, Roughly the same time, we're going to be seeing like the high-end desktop variants of roughly the same time as the Skylake CPUs, which made absolutely no sense at all, right? Because obviously that means that Intel are basically releasing so many different bloody competing platforms, it's cannibalizing its own market share. Thus, it's possible that motherboard manufacturers themselves weren't too happy about this, because it means that it's quite difficult to sell through the chips to their compete, you know, the Asus's and so on. And it also leads to a bit of consumer confidence and scratching of heads as well. Skylake, from what we understand, is going to have a multitude of different improvements. Um, NATA Sativ Express is supposedly going to be built in, which is going to mean that SSDs are going to be able to become a lot larger, more powerful. Thunderbolt 3, 40 gigabytes per second, DDR4. Um, but there are some problems <clears throat> because... Once again, if you want to be a high-end user, like basically um, someone who's used to overclocking, there's going to be some problems. Because 
Skylake supposedly is not going to have an unlocked multiplier, at least in the third quarter um, of 2015, this year in other words, by which I mean that there's not going to be a K derivative. So I'm sure any PC gamer probably knows this anyway, but let's say if you were to look at the Sandy Bridge, there's been like the 2500K or the 2600K and so on, and the K of course denotes the fact that the multiplier is unlocked, which means that us um, you know, us overclockers could simply raise the clock speed to, you know, a pretty good speed. Um, you know, you can get a gigahertz plus on some of the chips. But that's not looking to be the case with this. Supposedly, from what Intel have murmured, they don't have any intentions to, the, uh, to launch Skylake with an unlocked multiplier. I guess technically you might be able to get a smidge out of the FSB, but judging by what we're seeing with, like, just for example, Haswell, good luck. Uh, in other words, it's going to be minuscule. You know, you might get a few hundred megahertz at best, which is, let's face it, not ideal. So you've got obviously the Haswell case, you've got the Broadwell and Locks, which do offer overclockability, but the problems with that is that you're associating with SATA Express support and DDR3. So that's obviously going to be a bit of a slap in the face. So it's like... I'm not really sure what Intel are doing here. Uh, obviously, the problem is just lack of competition. Hopefully, the fact that AMD are working on a new CPU, which is known as AMD Zen, that is, of course, Z-E-N, and that's been announced by the CEO of um, AMD. I actually just didn't get around to covering it because I fail and suck at the internet, but... Supposedly, um, this is going to be a high-end performance part. It's not necessarily going to be an APU, although details are a bit sketchy at the moment. It is going to be x86-64 bit, as one would as you know suspect, really. Um, and supposedly, Intel are a bit concerned by Zen. Now, you might scoff and you might say to yourself, "Well, AMD haven't really released a killer CPU." I would point out the Athlon line, and I would also point out, well, I'm talking about the original Athlon line, and I would also point out Athlon 64, and also the Athlon X2s. The 939, I mean, when it, when uh, AMD went to 754s, like the claw hammers, it was, and this is like the 64-bit era, when 64-bit CPUs were becoming a thing, um, they were quite nice, they were hot as hell, but... They were also single channel, um, so the claw hammers were okay. Uh, 754 of memory serves as 754. I jumped on the 939 bandwagon, which offered uh, dual memory channels and a few other bits, and I got the Venice Core and it overclocked the absolute ridiculous amounts. I think the default clock speed on my Venice 3000 was like 1.1.8 gigahertz of memory serves, and it went all the way up to like 2.7, I think mine. Um, and even prior to that, you had the original T-breads. T and the thing was, it wasn't just like the Athlons that were really fast. Intel um, actually got punched in the ribs a bit by, in, uh, by AMD's Durons. Uh, Durons were... There were a few changes. I believe it was the cache on most of them. I believe the cache was reduced quite significantly, and I think there were a few changes to do with the bus. However, they were still ridiculously powerful, and like for like, they would generally beat the Celerons. And that's not to say that Celerons weren't had a bad run. At that time, of course, you know, prior to that, a couple of years prior, Intel had like the 300As, which overclocked like 450 to 500 megahertz, which of course now is pitiful. And then Intel released like the Pentium 3s, and then AMD started to release these Athlons, which just absolutely kicked butt. And then Intel released a Netburst architecture, which was a bit of a disappointment, to be honest. Netburst, especially like early in Pentium 4s, where, you know, the, the long pipelines weren't even being... How can I put it? They weren't even being leveraged by, say, hyper-threading, uh, which, of course, is the act of running pretty much two threads on the same CPU core. Which is basically what even 477s and so on are using now. Uh, the same type of technology. So it's like, it, it's quite interesting really when you think about all of this. I would, I would like to be honest, I, and this is going to sound a bit poor, um, because obviously I'm reporting the news, but my p 
but, you know, biased and all. I would personally like AMD to be on top for at least a year in the CPU market. The reason behind this is I don't really feel that Intel are putting in as much effort as they should be. Um, I'm reading these Skylake specs, and yes, it's really cool about the DDR4 memory. I'm not, I'm not going to bullshit you that it's quite interesting. And there are some other, you know, niceties, like, for example, the SATA being built on board. But what I don't want is for us as gamers to be like, well, gee, do I, you know, please, Mr. Intel, I, I don't know whether I want to not be able to overclock and have DDR4 support or... And I suppose it depends on how applications deal with the memory bandwidth. Because we might be at this point where if you've got low enough latency DDR3, you, and especially if you're not using like super amounts of cores, it might be okay for now. My memory bandwidth might not be a big deal if you're not using the int uh, integrated uh, graphics processor. Or, so in other words, you're not using like the HD uh, CPUs, for, uh, GPUs, built into the um, into Intel's own processors but eventually these games are going to become really demanding especially as games become increasingly multi-threaded because obviously fairly obviously as games become increasingly multi-threaded they're going to need more bandwidth because the them cores don't feed themselves right and furthermore and uh, uh, this is just me with no real knowledge on this this is just me guessing because I've not played around with the X12 code, I don't have DirectX 12 code, and from what I'm hearing, DirectX 12 uh, GPUs are going to basically not even be out yet. They're working on DX12 GPUs. So just assume that this is my, my speculation, because I don't want to bullshit you and say this is a rumor, this is my speculation. But when you think about it, one of the main perks of DX12, and this has been what every developer under the sun has said, is the fact that every CPU core, let's say you've got a quad-core CPU just to make things easy, rather than having like all the rendering happening on one CPU thread at a time, despite the fact that technically any CPU thread or any CPU core can run that thread, but let's assume for the just sake of argument that when DirectX 12 comes, it's going to be a bit different. You know, you're going to have all of these graphics contexts, all of these draw cores are going to be able to be issued from, you know, all four of these cores at once, theoretically. And because, obviously, CPUs and GPUs are becoming increasingly paralyzed, um, parallelism is obviously going up all the way. Who knows? Um, you know, at the end of the day, one of the problems that you're seeing with even the Xbox One, and we were discussing this just the other day when we were doing the analysis of the Xbox One's GPU architecture, um, and obviously some of this is going to change when DirectX 12 becomes a thing for the Xbox One, but let's assume that like CPU core 0, uh, let's just assume 0, uh, has a bit of a delay fetching data from memory, because like all of the other cores are like busy accessing it or there's a lot of stuff going on, especially as the Xbox One's GPU is doing some texturing sometimes from RAM. So you could have this instance where if especially if it's trying to get a load of data, that CPU core can kind of stall. So it sometimes will switch to a different context, which is possible. So my point being that DDR4 memory uh, could become quite important later on, uh, even for desktop games. And that is just gaming. Who knows what the other ch benefits are going to be in the future? Because I don't like to say this, but let's face it, quad core is kind of normal now, but a lot of applications are still not using it. Many applications are just not using it as effectively as they could be. Obviously, some of them are. Like if you're using something like Adobe Premiere, it is better. But even Adobe Premiere, um, it's still quite early where it's leveraging the GPU when it's doing exporting, for example, with CUDA or um, even you know using the GCN architecture from AMD. So a lot of this with compute is also becoming quite quite early. So anyway, that's just, I kind of went off a bit of a tangent on this one, but um, hopefully you've enjoyed the video anyway. So yeah, I'm not quite sure what to suggest with this whole Skylake thing. Previously, I had suggested to anyone and their mother who was looking to upgrade just to wait until Skylake. Now, with what I'm hearing about the overclocking, what I'm hearing about the fact it's being delayed, it might be an idea just to buy like, I don't, I'm not giving a super example here, 
but it's up at like a 4670. Overclock the balls out of it until early next year, and then jump on the DDR4 bandwagon with either Intel or AMD, depending whichever one does the best. But obviously the problem is it's really difficult to plan for the future. It's difficult to know what's going to happen three months down the line, let alone six or 12 months down the line in computing, simply because there are so many NDAs and so many... It's not just Intel working on a CPU, then you have to consider, well, what's AMD working on the background? What's Corsair and other uh, RAM manufacturers working on the background? What's going on with Microsoft and um, DDR4, so it's quite a, it's quite an interesting time. So what I'd probably recommend, um, a bit of a, a bit of a cop out, but if you're looking for a CPU and Skylake was your thing, you know, like you're waiting for Skylake, it might be better, assuming you could deal with like a lower end CPU, just get like a 4670 or something similar. Or if you've got a good CPU already, um, like a 2500K, maybe just overclock the balls out of it you know, get like a, a, a reasonable water cooling solution, you know, you can get one of those, I forgot the name of it, I think it's H80 or something like that, um, my memory is failing today, but yeah, just get one of those, run that, overclock the balls out of your 2500k, done, you know, even if you get another two, 300 megahertz out of the sucker, at least you know you're going to be pretty cool over the winter, you know, let's say you're running at 4.5 gigahertz, 4.8 gigahertz on 2500k, you're not really going to need any more this year. Anyway, that's just my thoughts on the matter. Do let me know what you think on this one. Anyway, take care and bye for now.